the accountability was the biggest thing. And that's what, that's where I felt like, Oh my goodness, I don't know what to do here with us because accountability is the cornerstone of a DS relationship. If without that there, you're wasting your breath. I don't even know what you're doing. And so it was really strange for me. And so she and I started talking and I had recommended that she start listening to some podcasts and some reading some books and doing some stuff because I felt like she was not educated enough on what we wanted to do or what we thought we wanted to do. And I wanted her to be up to speed and understand what it is because she had already had someone telling her, I'm a Dom, let me tell you what you're going to do. And I didn't want to do the same thing. So I stepped back from that and said, why don't you understand this stuff and then we'll continue to talk about it. And then at some point, if we get this all worked out with him, you know, you and I can figure out how we're going to work. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 322. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a wonderful conversation with Princess and Dee Dee. As you'll see, they've been together about three and a half years, and they are currently in a Dom sub dynamic where he is her daddy. And we have a lovely conversation about how they really created the relationship that works for them. Yeah, this is in our first, uh, what they call daddy, Dom, little girl, or uh Uh, caregiver little, and it doesn't have to be, and I think that, sorry, it doesn't have to be a daddy dom, right? They talk in this episode about mommy doms and and sort of all of the dynamics that go into this sort of world of BDSM and and power exchange and really support. It's Mm -hmm. really a supportive dynamic. And I don't know, I just, I love this conversation and, and we talk about their dynamic quite a bit and how they got there. And just super grateful. And what role non-monogamy plays in that too. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they're starting to open this up to polyamory. They started in swinging, then they got into the Dom sub. And they, it's just been a beautiful journey. It has. And yeah. I'm just, I'm going to tell you the whole episode. You don't even have to listen anymore. <laughs> no. no, this is fantastic. Thank you to both of them for coming on and sharing their story. We reached out to them actually on Instagram. We 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 brought them in. So yes. that's unusual. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for being willing to come on and share. We're super grateful. One quick thing we did want to say about this interview, and we we try to acknowledge this when this happens, but when when one or the other person in the, the interview does the bulk of the talking, we often feel like you don't get to see what we get to see. And so what we saw was a whole lot of negotiating of who's going to say what and how leading up to the questions and stuff. So we just, we wanted to put that out there that there wasn't like somebody's being coerced into this or anything. All of our communication has been amazing with these two. So I just, it, it felt important, I think, to say that up front because um, it's easy to hear sometimes and and assume like, oh, you know, maybe somebody doesn't want to be here or somebody's just taking over. And that was really not the case. So we just felt like maybe it's a podcast. You don't get to see what we get to see. Yeah. They were both very engaged and present throughout this whole interview. Yeah. So once again, thank you, Dee Dee and Princess. We're super excited to get your story out there. For anybody listening, that if you would like to learn more about them, they have generously shared photos and their Instagram page and their other social media. So you can check out all of the stuff that they're up to and interact with them. To find all that information, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the podcast tab. There you'll find show notes and you can find links to everything Finn just mentioned there. For anyone who is a premium subscriber, we're going to jump right into the interview now. And for anyone else, we have a few announcements. First up, if you're not familiar with the premium subscription, you hear us talk about it most weeks. <laughs> it's a way to skip the announcements up front, jump right into the interview, and but don't worry, you still get important dates in the outro. To sign up for the premium subscription, just go to our website and scroll down on the homepage and you can sign up right there. And those important dates that you might miss... There's one coming up just in a few weeks here, January 26th, as our next virtual meet and greet. You all know what these are by now. 
We put you all together in Zoom. We ask amazing questions. You have amazing conversations. You meet amazing people, and you have an amazing time. So come spend two hours with us in a few weeks. These are open to anyone. You just have to be open-minded and respectful. And amazing. And amazing. (laughs) You can sign up on our website under the events tab. Super simple and straightforward. We would love, love, love to have you come join us and meet like-minded people. Next up, we want to remind you all about our virtual community, and we're going to do that a little bit different today. Our virtual community is made up of amazing people from all around the world, and actually, just like tomorrow and the next day, basically this coming weekend when this episode comes out, January 12th to the 14th, we have almost 50 amazing people descending upon Atlanta from all over the country, and we're super excited. We're just going to spend a weekend together connecting, keeping it chill, but but really building some in-person community. And so it'll be an in-person community gathering. Yeah. So it's a little late for you, listener, to join us at this point, but we just wanted to throw that out there so you know that this virtual community also has an in-person component. We do these types of retreats once or twice a year. We're going to start working to get them up to two times a year around the country, and we're super excited about that. So that's the biggest plug today is there is an in-person thing happening. If you want to be a part of the next one, no time like the present to join the community. I was like, in the meantime, you can join virtually and get to know lots of amazing people. To sign up, go to our website again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the community tab. All of the information is right there. Yeah. We hope to see you there, and we can't wait to see all of you listening that are going to be here in just a few days. Finally, a quick reminder, while you're on our website, go over the resources tab. It is a new year. It is a great time, as always, to get tested for STIs. By using the links on our website, on the resources tab, you get $10 off making a 10-panel test, only $129, and you support the podcast, support the show. So we really appreciate you using those links and knowing your sexual health status. Yeah, this is Emma and I's favorite way to get tested for STIs. We've told you this for a long time because it's true. We use this service. We love this service. We wouldn't tell you about it otherwise. And so thank you to all of you who used the service last year to, again, as Emma said, know your sexual health status, have those amazing conversations so we can keep everybody in the community safer. And thank you to everybody who's going to go and use those links this year to do the same. We are very, very grateful. Yes, we are. A quick reminder, while you're on our website, you can reach out to us, send us a voicemail, send us an email. If you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we would love to hear from you. If you have any feedback for us or any questions, we would love to hear from you as well. Yep. And with that, we're going to jump right into this interview with Princess NDD, and we will see you all on the other side. Let's go. Welcome to the podcast, Princess and Dee Dee. We are excited to talk and hear about your story. We actually connected with you on Instagram because you were pumping up using STD check and we're such fans that <laughs> we're like, we need to talk to these two and we need to send them some swag. So swag was delivered and now you're delivering your story to us. So welcome. We're excited you're here. We're happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to, to get a chance to talk to you guys. Yeah. We'd love for you to start just by introducing yourselves uh, at whatever level you're comfortable with. I'm DD. I am uh, 59 years old, and I've been living a non-monogamous lifestyle for probably 10 years now, maybe a little bit longer than that. I don't know the exact moment and date. I haven't really tracked it, but it's been a crazy journey. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm Princess. I'm 37, and I've probably been doing some form of non-monogamy for probably the same, like 10 years. It just progressed from more of a, you know, like a swinger type to a poly thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Totally. The, the, the inevitable, well, I won't say it's inevitable, no, but no, the, no, no, no. Don't the old, the comments. old <laughs> adage of swingers who get feelings. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the concept. So yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, well, first let's start with how, how long have you two been together and maybe what does your dynamic look like today? And then well, we're going to, we're going to go back in time individually and figure out what happened a decade ago that started you both on this path. I think our dynamic is best described as a DS dynamic. I am her daddy, and she is my little girl. For those who know about the BDSM world, um, it's a very specific type of dynamic. 
And when we first started seeing each other, I have been a dom before this relationship and had no inklings that this was where things were going to end up, to be honest. <laughs> but um, it just clicked for us. It just fit. And when we started interacting, our dynamic kind of took a shift after a little, a short period of time. And we both talked about it and it just felt like a thing. And, you know, I'm happy to go into detail later um, about what that is and what mm -hmm. that means. Um, but that is, that is the nature of our relationship. We are nesting partners and we're polyamorous. And we've been together for a little three and a half, about three and, three and a half, half years. years. And we've lived together just over a year. Okay. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And we're excited to dig into the, the daddy, dom, little girl dynamic. Cause we've, We've had somebody, we've had a couple people. previous guests on that we've talked about this. And so we're always excited to to dig deeper on it and hear more perspectives on it. So yeah, it's definitely, I would say, underrepresented. And so we're grateful you're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we do that, we'd love to just dive in into like what brought you to non-monogamy, each of you, back about a decade ago. And I guess I guess I get to go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say when as with my previous husband, we were married maybe a couple of years and then we had started exploring. Like I, I was always, I always knew I was bisexual and, um, I, he was my second husband. So my first husband didn't, wasn't like encouraging of that. And so my last husband, he was more encouraging of that. And he encouraged me to go ahead and explore that, um, by myself. So originally it was, I was, going out and hooking up with women basically, or occasionally when that would happen and that was okay. And he was fine with that. And we never had any problems around that. Then it kind of transitioned into like more of a threesome thing. Like, you know, we had some threesomes and then I got a job at, I used to work at a fully nude couples only swingers resort. <laughs> so, so uh, standard job yeah yeah right <laughs> like, i did office work so i was i was office manager for like four years part of that job is being naked <laughs> like, it's very interesting i got to meet a lot of interesting people and talk to a lot of interesting people but from being there i guess we started to explore more of like swinging so we had swung with like a couple of couples and from there we dated a couple we had like a polycule type situation for about 10 months and then it ended very badly. <laughs> like, but uh, we decided at that point we wanted to date separately, but we still want to con continue to like date other people. So that's kind of like how I went from the swinging to the poly transition. And that's like a very uh, short version of that. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I, lo I love that. And uh, roughly, like, what time span was that from, right, the, hey, yeah, please go explore this aspect of your sexuality, bisexuality, to, okay, we've gone through all of the things and a, a four-year stint as a, a nude a nude office manager, which, by the way, <laughs> sounds like a great job. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> we'll definitely probably ask questions about that at some point. <laughs> so the, from there to, to, yeah, it's more polyamory. Because those are, each one of those, I think, is a big, I mean, that's a big transition, right? Going from yeah. monogamy to non from n monogamy to swinging, from swinging to couple, like more dating, from dating to polyamory. Those are each one of those is a big transition. Well, unfortunately, we probably didn't have like a lot of conversations around it. It just kind of happened. I mean, we did have a conversation around my exploring with other women. Mm -hmm. That was a conversation. But uh, as far as transition into swinging, I think it was more of just a situational thing. Like I worked at this place and I saw this stuff happening. I was like, this might be cool. So we, I actually, the first time, the first couple that we did that with was actually somebody I met at work. <laughs> like some people that I met at work and I thought they were cool. And so we decided to hang out outside of work. Mm -hmm. um, but from there, the poly part ended up because 
I had a friend and she had been my friend for like five years and she wanted to ask me on a date. So she actually texted him to ask if he was okay with that. And he was fine with that. And then it, it started like me and her were going out and then we were like kind of having like threesomes and it was kind of like, she'd come over to my house and be with us. And then I'd go to her house and be with her and her husband. And then at some point me and her had a conversation. It was just like, so are we dating? Like, is this like a girlfriend thing? And then we just, we talked about it and decided like, well, I wanted to date both of them and she wanted to date both of us. So that's kind of how it ended up being a poly situation. So it's those slow amorphous shifts that just sort of happen because of circumstances. And I think that is a very common trajectory Mm -hmm. for for maybe a lot of us Mm -hmm. in this world. And it probably from one to the other, maybe six years. Yeah. 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 It didn't happen in one month, which (laughs) there's nothing wrong with if that happens, but for, yeah, Yeah. it it wasn't this uh, immediate shift. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I I would say too, like we, I'm sure we could do a whole episode on your journey princess, but Mm -hmm. I think what I would love is to, to get Dee Dee's sort of version. And then let's dig into the two of you and what, what this looks like for the two of you. Cause I think that is a really, I'm, I'm excited and it's a, it's a juicy place to go with this. So, (laughs) (laughs) so let's, let's hear about it. Dee Dee. How, how did you get into this? I don't even know how I got here, to be honest. <laughs> no. I um, it so I had um, met my my most recent wife, who um, we're actually uh, in the process of a divorce right now, and will be final any time. We're still talking to each other, so we've been able to keep it civil, but that relationship has basically ended. We were together fifteen years. And when we met, I had just been coming out of a divorce. Um, We had a mutual friend who had talked about her to me, but I didn't know her. Um, We were in the, you know, this group of friends. She was kind of a fringe person to me. And so I uh, was invited to a house party. She was also invited. We met there and I was instantly taken and thought, this is a thing I need to pursue. And so we immediately started dating. And two months later, I was moving in with her. (laughs) And four years later, we were married. And uh, when I first met her, she was actually dating a couple and two men. So you know, we talked about that, you know, and I was like, wow, because I had only been in monogamous relationships. I came from a very strict Christian background. None of this was on my radar. None of it was anything that I had even in my wildest dreams thought about. Um, so for me, it was, it was really interesting and challenging to my way of thinking when we first met, but I really was in love with her and I didn't want to, you know, just throw it away because I was, you know, in for this relationship. So we've talked about it. She ended those relationships the next day after she met me, she says, this is going to be a thing. And she let all four of them know that she was ending that. And, and I didn't find that out immediately. It was probably, I don't know, a, a little while later, later before a few months, at least before I even knew that that had happened. So did you, you didn't even know these other people existed or you didn't know that she had ended them? I think it was probably about two months before I knew that, that they existed. Wow. Okay. I mean, she had told me that she was dating, you okay. know, but yeah, she yeah, didn't yeah. give me sure. specifics, you know, and I wasn't prying, you know, I, yeah, I yeah. just was like, oh, okay, you're dating, whatever. And, um, So it was a couple months later before I even knew that that was a thing. Got it. But then that sparked a conversation, of course. And I was intrigued and I was like, so how does that work? And what's Mm -hmm. that about? And blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she talked to me about a little bit. She talked to me about a famous swinger club out here in Southern California that's in the Inland Empire. No longer with us, unfortunately. 
fell victim to COVID or whatever. But um, she had been going there. She was invited there by some friends. She had dated the body painter. (laughs) 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 And um, I mean, I don't know if I just call it dating, but they had gone out a few times. And then uh, she started getting in, meeting some other people. And that's how she met this couple. And and they went on. So she had told me about it. And I, and I told her, I I said, you know, I'm not really sure that I'm up for that kind of thing, but I would like it to be a possibility since you are, you know, okay with this. I said, you know, at some point that maybe we can explore something like that. And she said, maybe someday we can. And that kind of was the last of the conversation. No, we didn't talk about it again for a long time, years. I don't even know how long. <laughs> and then uh, we're very big Renaissance Fair people. Mm-hmm. Uh, been attending the, the Renaissance Fair that started all the Renaissance Fairs across the country. It was based here in Southern California. And I've been attending since 1978. And so when we were there and we started hanging out in this one particular area, we ran into this couple once upon a time and they had said they were interested in possibly going out with us. And I was in real shock (laughs) because that just (laughs) didn't happen in my lifetime. Um, and, um, you know, they were very attractive, younger couple, nice people. And, you know, she and I had only had a brief conversation about it a couple times up to this point. Your your current your partner at the time, yeah, my, your wife. My the my wife at the time, yeah. And so I was, you know, kind of like a little off balance, but she was engaging in the conversation with these folks. You know, I'm where I'm standing there, but she's engaging in the conversation because I was just sitting there with my chin on the floor, probably. And uh, she said, "You know what? We'll we'll talk and we'll get back to you guys." And she looks at me and she says, "I guess we got to have a conversation about this." And I just didn't know what to do with myself. So I I was like, okay, sure. And so then on the way home from fair that night, we talked about it. And I said, is this something you're seriously considering? And she says, well, it could be something that I would seriously consider. But the timing of it's bad because at that time uh, in our relationship, we were actually having a little bit of a thing that I didn't know was going to eventually become a big thing. So. Around that same time, I uh, right before that, I had informed her that I was going to donate a kidney to my cousin. My cousin is a year younger than me, and he is like my brother. We were raised very close. So uh, he had polycystic kidney disease. And 20 years prior to this point, he had um, been diagnosed with it. I lost my uncle, who is his father, to polycystic kidney disease and some complications. And so when uh, he had tested and came back positive, I told him, hey, if at any point you need a kidney and I'm able, I will do it. And so (laughs) fast forward 20 years and he calls me on my way home from work one day and says, so you that kidney still available? And I'm like, "Uh, sure. Um, Yeah. What do I got to do? You know, I'll go get tested or whatever we got to do. So. That was a three-year process from the time that he told me and we went and eventually did the surgery. It was about three years. We top surgeons, everything went well. He's still with us, still doing good. I'm healthy and fine. That all went great. Um, Unfortunately, it was not that easy for my wife at the time. She had come from a household where her father was not a very nice man ever. Um, and then he became, uh, very, very ill the last 12 years of his life and was house ridden and then bedridden and was in, in, in pain and took it out on her and her mom. So she had a visceral reaction to me telling her that I was going to donate a kidney because she didn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. And she was very, upset about it and it caused us a lot of strife in our marriage because she felt like I took away everything from her. I didn't, you know, she was worried I was going to be an invalid or something and she'd have to take care of me like her dad and all this kind of thing because people don't deal with their mental health sometimes like they should. And it was an unfortunate situation that took 
uh, many, many years. Um, so we pushed pause on the couple who had asked us, but we did become friends with them. And then she and I went to therapy and we went to personal, you know, individual therapy and couples therapy and everything. And then six years later, we're finalizing our, what I think is going to be our last day in group therapy together. Uh, and the therapist says, well, you know, guys, you guys are doing great. Your communication's strong. Everything's good now. Is there anything else you want to talk about? And she dropped the bomb and she says, well, there is one more thing. And I'm freaking out because I'm like, I thought we had covered everything. <laughs> I thought we were, I thought we were about to graduate. <laughs> I know. I thought we were done with this, you know? And then she, she says, so, um, still think you want to talk about swinging? And the therapist chin hit the floor and mine chin hit the floor and she just laughed at us. <laughs> and so we had two or three more sessions while we figured out what we wanted to do and so that she could help us guide us through that. And um, we decided, yeah, we were going to do it. So um, she called up the female partner from the other couple um, who we had been we had been great friends with for now six years. You know, we hung out with them all mm -hmm. the time. It was the longest foreplay I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and we, I was sitting there and she goes and gets the phone and she picks it up. She calls her and says, you still want to fuck my husband? <laughs> I swear. And she said, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, everybody likes, you know, big positive consent. And so we, we, Talk to them and we made arrangements and we thought we were going to do this thing, but we had to wait a little bit of time just between, you know, them and our schedules. And in the meantime, we jumped on, you know, uh, the website that all of us use, the one that starts with a K. I don't know if you like to use You can, you can say, it, yeah, go for it. Cassidy. So we put a profile on Cassidy.com immediately, you know, how it happens when you're new everybody's like inbox 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. fresh meat yeah <laughs> and so there was a couple in the area i was we were living in the south bay of los angeles at the time and there was a couple there who was a little bit a little bit older more experienced swingers that have been around the community for a while and i get the feeling that they do this relatively com commonly um they reached out to us as new people and they said hey we'd like to meet for drinks so we did we actually went to a wine bar and they brought their third which they didn't tell us about until he got there. And uh, so that was interesting. <laughs> and we're like brand new, right? We don't know anything about anything. And I was just sitting there going, oh, okay. So this is a thing. And that they were really nice. There's three of them. <laughs> yeah, that there was three of them. And I, you know, I'm like, I'm still trying to figure out what swinging is, pal, you know, but <laughs> they were really sweet people. They were really nice. All three of them were, were really good. And we ended up being friends with them. And, uh, about two days after that, they invited us to our first house party. There was going to be a hot tub and, you know, food and beverages and it was in the neighborhood and it was closed. So we said, yeah, we'll go. And, uh, that was the first night that we broke one of our first rules. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you know how it is when you first start, you start off with all these rules to keep everybody safe and comfortable. And I'll be honest, I didn't have a whole lot of rules. She had many, many rules. <laughs> Um, and you know, I'm not a jealous person. So for me, it was easy to just kind of whatever, mm -hmm. you know, let's trust each other and let's do this together. We'll, if we bump up against something, we'll talk about it and work through it, blah, blah, blah. So we ended up in separate rooms, which wasn't a thing until that moment, but I had gone down and told her, I said, so she's invited me to go here and you're down here. Do you want me to stay? Do you want me to go? She says, no, go. I'll eventually get up there. And I was like, oh, okay. So same room developed into same house. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so we just, we continued and we started doing a bunch of stuff. We were up and down in the swinging community, but we did develop a lot of friends. We had a regular Thursday night bar group that went to dive bars and we just hung out with them. We did big house parties, small house parties. We definitely had challenges through that process, mostly because there was a lot of times on her part where I was having a hard time getting her to tell me what the real thing was that was going on. So she would tell me one thing and I would say, okay, I'll do this. You know, no giving phone numbers. Okay, great. No social media. Okay, great. 
but then she would give somebody social media. <laughs> and so I thought it was okay. So then I gave them my social media and then found out, well, no, it's not. Um, because I'm giving, I use my social media as most humans as a person. <laughs> and she used, she was giving her, her business mm -hmm. social media. And so I didn't realize that at the time, obviously, you know, it was my error for not asking, but I mean, we're all standing three feet apart when this happened and I thought I was okay. And that was, you know, me not doing the right thing. So those kind of things, ups and downs happened for a while. We finally reached a point where we were leaving uh, a very nice evening with a couple, but we realized that maybe we weren't cut out to be in the same room. Mm -hmm. because we had a hard time focusing mm -hmm. <laughs> on what we were supposed to be doing. We're too worried about what the other person's doing. So I was always worried, you know, is she happy? Is she okay? Is this guy treating her all right? Is she getting what she wants and needs and whatever to pay attention to the partner that I was supposed to be helping find, you know, whatever pleasure we could. So that evening on the way home, she turns to me and says, so what do you think about us dating separately? because it seems like we're having struggles with this being with other couples, not to mention the fact that, you know, that's the true unicorn in swinging is finding a four way match. <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure. If that's what you want to do. And we had some friends who, you know, and she referred to them and talked about, see, the, that's how they were having that struggle. And this is better for them now. And do you think we could do this? And I said, yeah, I think we can give it a try, you know, and if it doesn't mm -hmm. work, we'll hear another thing out. So we made the mistake of going on Tinder and <laughs> going off on that direction. And her inbox was full constantly. And she could have gone out with a different guy every single night. And there were crickets and dust and cobwebs in mine, um, <laughs> except for the girls looking for sugar daddies. And, you know, I didn't really take any of that seriously because I knew that they just mm -hmm. weren't. So. We went on, um, and eventually that was good. We did have a, a much better success in our relationships, and it would seem to be going well for both of us too. You know, as, as far as how things went, so I uh, was having a hard time meeting anybody online, and so I thought, well, I know this this lady from the Renaissance fair and I have known her for years and we've always flirted because that's what you do at the Renaissance fair. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, and I knew she was Polly. And so I was like, well, at least I might be able to find somebody I can date. So I called her up and said, Hey, would you like to go on a date? And she said, yeah, absolutely. So we went on a date and she's been my partner for five years, I think now, something like that, roughly. And, you know, that was my first real, what eventually became a poly relationship. Mm -hmm. It was just dating at first and we were, you know, having, you know, crazy monkey sex and it was great and we had a good time and it was very low pressure because she was a very busy person. So it was a matter of us just whenever we could get together kind of thing. And yeah. mm -hmm. it, it really fit really well. And then she ended up pregnant by her ex and I didn't even know they were seeing each other at all. And so we had a little discussion about that <laughs> and, uh, but she ended up uh, moving away. So now she lives in Seattle. So I actually have only seen her for like two hours in the last year and a half, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, you know, we're still together as far as we're <laughs> concerned. It's just a matter of figuring out how we're going to have more time to see each other. And she was raising a baby, so yeah. she was extremely busy being a mom. Oh, yeah. um, and then that led to me looking around to see if there was other people. Actually, just prior to that, I should say, wow, uh, that's how I met Princess. She and I actually worked for the same vendor at the Renaissance Fair, and I knew her husband at the time. He was, you know, all three of us were friends, and I just never knew that they were Polly. I didn't just did never come up. And I had been following her on social media because she does modeling. She does uh, a lot of alt stuff. And it was, uh, you know, it was fun to follow her, her pages because she's very sexy. And, uh, and then 
I commented, she had posted some pictures. She was self-tying some chest harnesses and some leg ties and stuff like that. And I had commented on one of her photos and said, oh, that's very pretty. And she said, oh, thank you. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I'd love to talk to you about this because I'm a rigger. I've, you know, been trained and I like doing rope work and shibari and what have you. And so we struck up a conversation and that conversation went on for months because. Well, first remember he, so my ex has been like, it was during COVID or in the beginnings of COVID. Oh, true. And so we're at home and I don't really remember the exact conversation, but it was something about just, oh, I kind of miss being with other people or something. And he's like, well, how about DD? Like, he seems interested. And I was like, oh, I'm really oblivious. So I was like, <laughs> you think so? And he's like, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, he was right. Yeah, he was right. <laughs> but uh, I was just like, what do you mean? He's just being nice. He's just telling me he likes my rope stuff. <laughs> I'm like, so then I actually, I, so then I was talking to him and I was being flirtatious, but then I was being very forward, which is not very like me, like normal. I, I'm forward with men, but not with women. So, like, <laughs> so he, I don't remember what exactly I was saying, but it was like making some kind of innuendo. And then I was like, do you want to find out for real? And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and that was, and that was, uh, that was the start of some more serious, uh, ongoing conversations because it was in the middle of covid and we couldn't see each other for months and months yeah i think it was probably two and a half three months so we just talked we just but talked we every talked day. every day and i'll tell you it's a great way to really you know to put us in a position where by the time we actually were together we we had talked about all of the things you know everything we were into not into what we did or didn't like what our challenges were what was going on in our lives and our relationships and everything so you know by the time we got together it was a pretty life-changing moment and uh we had met and gotten some food mm -hmm. and <laughs> you know neither one of us had a place so we ended up at a hotel um because and the we, rest is history right yeah <laughs> and then here we are in all these here years we are. later <laughs> and it's been fantastic so I love it. Well, thank you for catching us up, getting us up to speed. I think it's it's amazing. Like I always love two people who, you know, find each other somewhere along this journey individually because it you each bring unique experiences to what what I mean, right? There's there's really kind of two ways to do this, right? There's people who open up a non -mon or a monogamous relationship and then go on the journey together. And it sounds like You've both done that, and now you're both doing the, we come from a background of non-monogamy, and we're going to go on the journey together in a different way. And I think having both perspectives is really sort of a, a pretty amazing way to go about it. And and so, yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm curious then, like, how the dynamic developed between the two of you to where you got to today and sort of the dynamic you're in today and how that came to be. <laughs> Do you want to start? Or do you want me to? I'll just add to it. You just add to it. Okay. <laughs> like... So when when we first started seeing each other, her and her husband had a dynamic of a sorts, and I am a dominant. That's just who I am, and so I was unsure exactly how that was going to work. You know, I, I didn't want to step on toes. I didn't want to interfere. I didn't want to do anything like that. So. She and I had talked and, you know, uh, about it. And at that point, we hadn't really, we didn't really have any, you know, type dynamic or anything like that. It was just us talking. You know, there was some, some light play. play. Yeah, some fun play. But Thinkings there, and flogging. Yeah, but there wasn't <laughs> any, there wasn't any, you know, anything really to it. It's like, you know, you can go to a, a dungeon and you can have a dom. You know, if you're a sub, you can just say, hey, I would like to, you know, have a scene with you and you can get flogged. It was basically like that. They just function as a top. So we uh, had talked about it and how we're going to make that work. And 
I said, well, you know, I feel like I got to talk to him. You know, we got to have a conversation. So at that point, he and I had a conversation on text because he doesn't like to talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like we had covered it pretty well that, you know, I, I would like to have some kind of dynamic with her, but I don't want it to interfere with anything you guys have. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be more informed about what their dynamic was and how it worked and all the things. And just so that I could add to that, you know, my whole thing was when I came into this relationship with her, she's a married woman. You know, I, I just want to add to this. I don't want to detract from anything. I'm very much that way. I just want to bring good things into this mm -hmm. relationship. And I felt at first like, okay, it seemed like it was a relatively simple conversation and it didn't seem to be too complicated. There wasn't any real pushback, pushback or anything. Yeah. Um, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> yeah. Originally my, and my ex are di our dynamic was like I said, not now I wouldn't say is very real. <laughs> like at the time when it was happening, I would say like maybe because I didn't really know any better and he was making it seem like his experience was more than it was in actuality. So he was making it seem like he was really into us having a dynamic and him wanting to be a dom and wanting to do, you know, have like a DS dynamic most of the time. And I even had a caller. And when we talked about me and him, me and Didi having a dynamic, my ex, the way that me and him talked about it was kind of like, well, you and me do things that, you know, we live together. So the things that you're helping with, helping me with are things that, you know, are based on our lives together, things that are happening at home. And those are the kind of things I would like your help with or to focus on. And with Didi, it was like things that I think one of the big things was like sleeping, like going, getting a sleep schedule, like a regular sleep schedule or helping me with fitness and diet, because those were things that he was doing and interested in his own life. So I kind of had made a separation, like, you know, he's good at these things. So these are things that we're going to work on and you're good at these things. And so these are things that me and you will work on and there'll be two separate dynamics. But the whole point was to not have them overlap or like you said, anyone step on anybody's toes or to mm -hmm. feel like, you know, they weren't important or whatever. And it was okay for like, it was okay for some months. And then at some point, my ex decided that he was not okay with it. And it turned into a very big fight where he was forcing me to make a decision between the two of them. And I didn't want to make a decision, basically. I was just like, I, I don't want to pick because I've been having this set up for like months and I feel like it really works for me. And I was very upset that he was trying to make me pick. So he decided, well, then me and you don't have a dynamic anymore. <laughs> and he took her collar. It was very dramatic. It was very not, I can't say professional because it's not professional, <laughs> but it's not. It is not, it is not uh, you know, what most folks from the BDSM world would say was a proper way to end a relationship. Let's put yeah. it that way. It wasn't very relational. No, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty abrupt, pretty rough, pretty, you know, not good. That created, you know, a serious issue that continued for some time. She and I were trying to figure out what you know, what was going to happen and waiting for him to try to get back to us. And, and we just, we weren't doing anything at that point. You know, we just said, we're not going to do anything until we figure this out. You know, mm -hmm. we're just going to date. And so we went out on dates and what have you, but it became very, very serious, very quickly. And so she and I started having more in-depth conversations. You know, I am a more experienced Dom. I have had training with other Doms and, and, so I, I'm not an expert. I don't think that anybody should be calling themselves that because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's not like, Oh, I'm this now. And that's where I am. You, you know, it is a growth process. It's a, it's a process where you, you continue to learn 
and uh, develop your style of dominance and what have you as you go. And up to that point, mine was very much a more of a hard style dom, you know, traditional, what you think of accountability, punishment, punishment, if you aren't doing the things that you're supposed to do. And it's all under uh, consent, obviously. Mm -hmm. You have to pre-negotiate everything. You talk with your subs and you say, okay, what are the things you want to work on? What do you think? And then I would develop a plan and we put them into, you know, to uh, work. But, uh, you know, the thing that was going on with her and her husband was not that. What happened was she said, hey, I'm a sub. I would like to have a dom. I mean, it wasn't exactly this conversation, <laughs> but that that's basically what happened. And so he said, oh, I'll be your dom. And so he said, okay. He had said he had previous it, relationship experience yeah. with this. Yeah. I mean, I can't say for sure how truthful that is. <laughs> like, sure, but, sure. Um, but yeah, but that was what he said. So I was under the impression that he was more experienced than he was. And that wasn't the case. And then I felt like a lot of it, like the more I learned myself, I felt like he, he didn't care. Like he, he wanted it in name only and he didn't care about any of the other parts of being in a dynamic. Like it wasn't important to him. The accountability was the biggest thing. And that's what, that's where I felt like, Oh my goodness, I don't know what to do here with us Mm -hmm. because Accountability is the cornerstone of a mm-hmm. DS relationship. If without that, there you're wasting your breath. I don't even know what you're doing. Right. Um, and so it was really strange for me. And so she and I started talking, and I had recommended that she start listening to some podcasts and some reading some books and doing some stuff because I felt like she was not educated enough on what we wanted to do or what we thought we wanted to do. And I wanted her to be up to speed and understand what it is because she had already had someone telling her, I'm a Dom. Let me tell you what you're going to do. And I didn't want to do the same thing. So I stepped back from that and said, why don't you understand this stuff? And then we'll continue to talk about it. And then at some point, if we get this all worked out with him, you know, you and I can figure out how we're going to work. So that happened. And then very shortly after that was when the dark days happened. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when the dark days happen. Uh, yeah, I felt like the more that I learned or educated myself about poly or non monogamy or BDSM, that the more pushback I got from him. Mm-hmm. So I like I like I read Ethical Slut and I told him, you know, you should read this book. I think that it would be beneficial if you read this book. And he fought me so hard on this first it was i i don't have time to read this book and then i was like okay that's fine like uh you can listen to an audiobook or something and he's like no i don't want to do that i want a hard copy and i was like okay fine so i bought the hard copy and then it sat on the shelf for you know like a year and a half and he just refused and every time my opinion of something changed based on something i've read or something i learned or whatever he was like upset yeah, because I was changing. I guess that's how he viewed it. Yeah. She was growing. It wasn't a lot of on the other side. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there, if the foundation isn't there and somebody is masking or two people are masking to move through something, or maybe it's right. Fear of losing somebody, fear of abandonment. Fear, there's so many, there's so many traps and, and pitfalls that we can step into in this. And so it, it sounds like it sounds like you two have navigated a whole lot of them in your in this journey to to get here. And and it's it's very relatable because we've we've gone through ups and downs and you think, okay, this is gonna work, or and then it doesn't. And then it's like, oh, okay, back to the drawing board, and we just have to slow down. And it's it is a it is a tricky a tricky needle to thread. It truly really is. It is, mm-hmm. and so I'm I'm curious, like the if if you could expand a little on what maybe where you landed. Yeah, like what the dy- yeah what the dynamic you two have created is, and I know you you like labeled it, but what is it like? What does it actually look like in day to day practice, mm-hmm. and how you two move through relationship together? 
Sure. At first, we started with the more traditional model um, of a more what a lot of folks refer to as hard dom style, where she was given a list of tasks, be in bed by this time, make sure you drink this amount of water, you know, eat this way, do these things, whatever it was that she and I had come up with at the time. Everything's are pre-negotiated though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We had sit down and, you know, the first thing I did is send her a list of things. And I, I mean, I sent her a thing saying, you know, this is some examples, but I need you to fill this out for me and tell me what it is that you want. You know, what is it? Label them, prioritize your goals and whatever that might be. And it could be anything. It could be work goals, personal goals, financial goals, whatever mm-hmm. it is. But she sat down and she did that. And we put those together. And the very first thing that we had was, her sleeping, her sleeping habits were terrible. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that her husband uh, was not helpful in that he worked odd shifts and would come home in the middle of the night and then expect her to be awake. And then she had to get up the next morning and go to work and live her life and do the things. And he's sleeping. Yeah. And so she and I talked about it and, you know, we figured out a plan to help her get better sleep. And so she started, you know, going to sleep at a reasonable hour and that he agreed to, he was like, yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm supportive of this idea of her getting more sleep because it's affecting, you know, it, it can affect her health or has been affecting her health. So that started. And then over time, I, I can't really tell you exactly how it happened but um you know i had just started kind of a a pet name for her i had called her baby girl and she really liked that and i really liked it too and it became very comfortable and i i wasn't sure i didn't really know that much about daddy doms and so i my position on it was i'm not into age play i don't really want to do that And then we started talking a little bit more about it. And so I thought, you know, maybe it's just something, it's just an education thing. I need to educate myself. I need to understand it better because I can't really make a decision about this, whether or not we should, shouldn't, whatever it is for me, not for me until I know. So I did, I started reading up on it and understanding it. And then once I understood what it truly is, a daddy dom or a mommy dom is really a caregiver. Some people refer to themselves as caregivers. And really what it is, is people who identify as littles, she identifies as mostly a mid. Um, Littles are younger and mids are like 10 to 13, I think. Early teens. Yeah, (laughs) early teens. And so what that is, is the, the little or the mid they want to have time to just put away the world, all the things that they have to do in their life that require them to be a big person and be an adult and living our lives. And as you, you know, I'm sure are aware, it's kind of crazy these days. So it's even more, I think, challenging for some people. And so they want to put that away and they just want to be a little, they want to be a little kid. They want to, function as that and it's a very specific type of thing where maybe they're going to sit and they just want to color in a coloring book or they want to watch cartoons and you know have a pop tart or whatever it is and it really is them assuming this role of a a person and it's a comfort and for her she had been this way most of her life already anyway this is just her comfort she would comfort herself by putting on SpongeBob and watching SpongeBob or the Simpsons or whatever. It was time where she could click off the mom and the worker and the wife and just relax and not have any responsibilities. So what the caregiver does or what the daddy Dom or mommy Dom does is they provide that safe space for them to really be able to get into subspace. And especially as a little, you need to literally not have the responsibilities of an adult. So that means, you know, like she'll have a girlfriend over sometimes and for a little day and they'll come over and I'll set them up in here, um, in our room 
put the TV on, put on whatever they want and make them snacks. And I just make sure that whatever they need is taken care of. Now, that isn't the same as age play. Some people in the BDSMM community do do that. I am not one of them. I am not, you know, uh, trying to get with somebody because they're identifying as a younger person. There's nothing sexual about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the interplay with us as daddy and, uh, you know, princess uh, or little uh, baby girl is strictly to help facilitate that time for her. It doesn't have any sexual component to it. There are other parts of our dynamic where, yes, that is a thing. We do have sex and it does happen, but it has nothing to do with her being a little, you know, being a little. It yeah. just, it, it's a separate thing. It's kind of, uh, it's a very special time that we set aside and it takes place in a different way. When the rest of our dynamic, basically what it is, is me holding her accountable for all the things that she wants to get done, her goals that she set in her life and said, I need to do these things. I want to go to the gym and I want to do this and I want to do that. So I, we have an app, uh, it's the obedience app that we use. And I think people have talked about it on your show before. And we, I can set tasks in there that, that she has to respond to when she goes in there. And when she does something, she checks it off. One of the challenges for her is that she does the task, but she forgets to do the thing. So technically it's not over until it gets checked because <laughs> I don't get my notification. She goes, Oh, I already did it. And I'm like, but you, but did. you did. <laughs> checking the box. So, you know, and basically what that leads is to there's different things. She might have to write lines. So I'll give her some positive affirmation or something when she's really, really, really not done something that, that was important, she gets lines because she hates them the most. She'd rather let me spank her than she would <laughs> do lines. Than to write, yeah. you know, a hundred lines. So I'll give her, I'll give her lines and she'll, and it's usually a very positive, uplifting thing about whatever it was. So if she was supposed to be doing something that, you know, she said, Oh, I want to make sure that I'm doing my affirmation every morning and I didn't get it this morning. I forgot, whatever. Then I will have her write out why her affirmation is important, what that leads to when she doesn't do and blah, 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 blah. And so she writes that. So in that way, our dynamic is pretty much what a, most traditional doms do, you know, those types of things. But as far as how she addresses me, my honorific is daddy, our demon daddy. That's why my name mm -hmm. is DP. And at some point in time, we decided that princess was very fitting for her. <laughs> so those are the honorifics that we use for each other. And that's, that's how we address each other in our life. It's funny because we never set out to be a 24 seven dynamic, but I would say that we probably are more of a 24 seven dynamic than we aren't. Yeah. It, it just became, especially now that we live together. Um, it, it's just, you know, one of it those sounds things like it's that, built in to your yeah, relationship. It, structure. It, is. it is kind of built into our relationship structure. And, you know, I have friends and, and, uh, who are also doms and it's very separate part of their life. Their life being a dom is very separate from what their world is because of the nature of the relationship that they have with their sub, or maybe it's not somebody that they live with. It's somebody that they see occasionally or whatever. And that's the nice thing about dynamics is you can set them up any way you want. You know, we're all adults. You can, there's no rules. I mean, they, people like to say there's rules. So they like to be gatekeepers and say, Oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. And you got to make it this way or that way or the other way. And what I always tell people is it's not true. What you need to do is you need to sit down with the other person. You need to put out on the what table what it is you need, what it is you want and how you can work that out. And that's really what it all comes down to. And I okay. think like, from the subs perspective, or a lot of people hear it and think, you know, I'm just doing whatever he's telling me to do <laughs> and that I had no consent. Like we talked about everything has, we talked about everything. It was all things that I wanted to do or that most of it is that I lack motivation to do it myself. And I would mm -hmm. like someone to help me stay accountable, which also means that that person has to take on the responsibility of whatever 
that is because if you if I can't do it myself, then like saying like, okay, well, I'm going to ask you if you did it, but I'm not actually going to hold you accountable or stay on top of you or to make sure that you actually did it. And that was the problem with my ex was that we had talked about it. Like we had the conversation, like, let's say I want to go to the gym three times a week or whatever. And I need you to hold me accountable. He's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. But then he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I was like, so then he was like, well, I don't want to punish you. I'm like, okay, so let's try a reward system. When I go all these times, like then I get some kind of reward, right? So then let's try it that way. But the thing is just, he couldn't, he didn't want to be responsible for my stuff. And that was fine. Also, like, I was like, okay, that's fine. Then let's not do this. But you know, that was its own issue. But (laughs) yeah, no, I I get that. I think what it sounds like, and and I think I mean, you said earlier, like it was, it's kind of built in and it, and it sounds in, in a lot of ways, like it's a way to support one another. And like you were, it sounds like princess you were getting a lot of these things like you said you would flip on cartoons and maybe color like that was sort of already part of how you took care of yourself and so you kind of took that and built in some of these other aspects and then yeah the accountability aspect of it and and i love that you said like right it's negotiated because yeah dd's got to take he's got to decide do i want this responsibility right and what does that actually mean and like taking it serious that that you're doing it here that you're both in this you know, for reasons other than, you know, just sex and just pleasure. But there's also, it sounds like some real positive benefits to your life that have come out of this. Definitely. Yeah. I've made many improvements. <laughs> like, she's yeah. done, she's done fantastic. I, I, I have to, you know, brag on her and I do frequently because when we first met, she really was just kind of floundering. She didn't know because she didn't know. And that's the hardest part about, you know, wanting to, she didn't even know she was a little, <laughs> you know, she was doing all these self-comforting things that are, that fall into that world that fall into that category, but she just didn't even know that there, that that was a thing. So, you know, part of the process was educating her and myself on that and understanding what that looks like and how that works and what is and isn't good because mm-hmm. you can do not good things too. Obviously, if you, you don't want to, you don't want to make mistakes out of ignorance. So I'm a big advocate of let's go find out, you know, and that's why I tell people about any of these lifestyle things, whether it's BDSM or it's polyamory or whatever, swinging, you know, start off by getting all the information. Not everybody's built that way. I understand, but you know, people, how many times have you guys had on the show where they jumped in both feet into swinging or this or that, and then they immediately had to put the brakes on because things went crazy, you know, and then they had to figure it out after the fact. And sometimes it almost cost them relationships. So I try to point people in that way. You know, when I talk to folks who constantly are asking because they find out and they're like, Oh, Oh, I can talk to you about this, thing, yeah. you know? And then I'm like, yeah, sure. And, you know, and, we talk about it and it, it, it's always surprising to me that there, I think, you know, we all get caught up in the excitement of wanting to do something and we don't really know what doing something's going to be like until we start doing it. Mm. So you have to, you have to spend some time and, and educate yourself, you know, read, listen to podcasts, do the homework and then sit down and do the real work, which is sitting across you know, the table from each other and putting it on paper and talking about it, whether it's polyamory or BDSM, I think it's equally important to sit down and put it down. You know, you may throw it away, but at least work out your thoughts, talk about it, negotiate things and, and be understanding that this is going to change over time too. It's not going to remain the same. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's like an on, it's ongoing consent from both of you that you have to continually revisit to make sure like, yeah, this is still working. Is this still working? Do we, what shifts do we need to make? What ideas do we have? And, and checking in along the way. I'm also curious, like, do you two anticipate, I know, like where you might go in the future? Well, I mean, we have been so busy in the last three years that dealing with our exes and all that stuff. And then dealing with just life in general and trying to figure us out that, you know, she hasn't really had the chance to 
really date anyone. And so recently, that is something that I encourage her to do. I'm like, look, we kind of got a handle on what we're about now. We're in our own place. We got that going on. You know, the other stuff is starting to wrap up and we're we're moving through that. So do you feel comfortable enough that you want to try to pursue, you know, some dating? And so she did. She went on a couple of the apps that, you know, we heard about on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) She uh, went on field and she went on bloom and, we even tried polyfinda for a little while, but you know. So she's been dating this girl now for a little while. A few months. Yeah. Mm. And um I think that I think that that's gonna be a big big thing. She did not she had that support in her marriage in word. <laughs> yeah, it was he he really wanted it for him. To yeah, be- it, in the end, I feel like most of our non-monogamous adventures together were really a way for him to be with other people. And I feel like we had two different sets of rules. Like, you know, things were okay until, or like we could do whatever until he had a feeling about it. And then once he had a feeling about it, it was like, then the rules changed. And so he was never... He, I think he was confused about what he wanted and he wasn't being honest with himself. So every time I would try and bring it back to him, like, I feel like maybe you're not really poly or maybe you're just, you're like more of a swinger and that's, you're just about the sex part and you don't really want to be about the emotions part. And he would tell me that wasn't true, but he always had a problem when it came to the emotions part. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's what like was part of the problem in the end with, uh, how he felt about me and Didi was that he was like, he, my ex seemed like he was okay with, he had a very like hot wife mentality. He was okay with me being with other people. That was fine. He thought that was hot. He was like, go be with strangers. Like I wasn't, but he was like, go be with strangers. You know, you, I wouldn't care about that, but somebody who cares about you. No. <laughs> like, so it's, yeah, it's a different it's a different level of in, yeah scary mm-hmm. intensity mm-hmm. yeah it pings the insecurities in a different way so definitely yeah yeah so i think she's probably you know assuming that this continues the way it's going which i'm hopeful because i think that the lady she's seeing is just a doll she's really cool people so i'm you know, hopeful that she will be able to finally have that kind of relationship that she's wanted. And then we'll see. I mean, I think that we're going to, we're, you know, we still swing a little bit um, and we're going to continue to, you know, as we navigate the world, we'll find new partners. I'm sure I have somebody new that I'm talking to right now, but we'll see. So we'll, we'll probably continue down this path. I mean, I think, I don't think that our dynamics going to change. I don't think that that is, you know, I think that's kind of like the, the pillar we're building from, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it would be great. I mean, I would love to have, you know, coffee table, poly, you know, relationships, but you know, you gotta kind of see how that happens. I mean, you know, it, it's not something that happens easily. I think it takes a lot of work and it takes really the right people, the right mix of people. And, um, you know, my main thing is helping her, uh, reach her personal goals and her, the things that she really deserves after some of the stuff that other things that have happened, uh, to get her here. So, you know, I, I'm excited about the possibility of her having, you know, a girlfriend that she can just be with when she can be with her, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah. what do you, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously I would like to have kitchen table poly with some people <laughs> like that. Yeah. That's always, a you know, the fantasy, <laughs> Like, but I think, yeah, I think, now that he said like we got everything situated kind of with our exes and all that situation that we're in our dynamics real solid that we're kind of moving more towards 
the poly aspects and dating other people and um, working that into our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Is I, I, I'm just, I'm grateful to both of you for coming on and, and sharing because like I said, this isn't a dynamic we get to talk a lot about. And in this conversation, it, it actually opened it up to me in a different way than the, the previous ones around like, cause you kind of shared, like, it's really not that aspect of it is really not a sexual piece. It's more of a, a support and accountability and in some ways, maybe even an escape from, from the bullshit that is raining in on us all the time. And, and to be able to be that for each other is amazing. And I'm like, it, it was clear too, for you, Dee, Dee, that you, you take something away from this as well. The caregiving, it sounds like is, is part of who you are. And so you're both meeting each other in a place that, you know, probably most people look at it and go, well, that's, that's weird or that's uh, uh, right. But you're like, no, this is us. Like this is, and, and I think being open to just different ways to meet all of our needs is I think beautiful. And so I'm, well, and I I'm think, grateful. Yeah. I am grateful too, because people don't know about dynamics like yeah. this as often. And it's so, an option or that it's an option and it may be pe- something that people want. Right. And they don't even know, um, or even that they're just like, they don't even know that it exists out there. So thank you for being vulnerable enough to share uh, your stories and just the, what works for you and what you're finding. And that it's been a work in progress for you too, that you have to like, you know, yeah. go but stop, pause and go research and then come <laughs> back and like change things as you go and figure things out because that's what life's about. But thank you again for, yeah, just, just everything you shared. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm glad we could do it. And it really has been an interesting journey. I, I was adamantly against being a daddy dom. <laughs> you know, I was like, nope. But it was because I didn't have a clear understanding of what it was about. So, and that's kind of the way that I've always approached dominance is, you know, it, you, you're incumbent because of your responsibility, which I take very, very seriously. You know, I, I have assumed this role for someone else's life, you know, to, be there for them, protector, caregiver, you know, guide, mentor, whatever it is, all those things. There's so many things, you know, it's kind of like people equate it sometimes to a life coach with a little more serious consequences, Uh, (laughs) you know, but it is, it is that. So I spend, you know, I, and that's probably where I'll be spending a lot more of my time moving forward is educating myself about other aspects of dominance that I don't feel the strongest in, or I don't understand the best. And I have a mentor also, you know, we are part of a local dungeon and the mistress who runs that place has uh, agreed to mentor me. And she's been a professional dom, uh, dame for 20 something years, I think now. And so, you know, we all, got to continue to grow and learn, I think, because, you know, stagnation is slow death. So it it really is. It's very, very fulfilling. I, I think I spend a lot of time, obviously, talking about what I do for her because that's who I am. Um, but I, I've always been a caregiver my whole life. I've always had jobs that were kind of like that, watching out and taking care of people. And for me, that was the key that really told me I am actually a daddy Dom now that I understand what that is and it fits my personality and the way I approach my life and, and how I handle relationships. And even with my friends, I'm that person, you know, I've always been the person that people know they can count on to, you know, be there for them. So yeah, it was, it was very enlightening. I would have never in a million years guessed it because I just didn't have an understanding of it. Yeah. I think as like a sub, like the subs that are littles, they, I wouldn't say this is true of everybody, but a lot of them had some kind of trauma or something, you know, in their childhood. Maybe they had parents that weren't around or parents who weren't very good parents or something like that. And I feel like in this dynamic, it's almost like you get a redo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So maybe you were missing, like, I don't know, your dad wasn't around or something and you feel like, people weren't there to take care of you when you needed it or to give you a safe place or something. And then you, this dynamic kind of helps you with that, like heal from those like 
past traumas, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. And and I, I want to just clarify too, when I said like, you know, people might look in and say, oh, it's it's weird or be squicked out. It's not, I mean, I think for for my experience with that, a lot of it is around the age, right? And they see it and they, you know, as you kind of said, Dee Dee, that like you didn't want any part of that because of whatever, you know, you weren't educated on it. You didn't know, but then you dig in and you start to learn about it. And and it is you know, maybe the naming, right, is like, oh, well, daddy, dom, little girl, and people hear little, and they hear little girl, and then their brains go like, oh, this is creepy, like creepy guys hitting on young, right, or w- wishing they were, you know, kids, and and that's so far from what it is, but but I think that's really quick for people to jump there, and so I'm, yeah, I'm, I appreciate you sharing that, like, your initial reaction was like, no, I don't want that, and then it was, let me get educated, and it sounds like education is just it has been the theme for the two of you this whole time, like reading books, getting like listening to podcasts, learn, 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 and then play and practice and go down the path. And I think that's beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, a necessity. And, and you're right. People look into it or hear about it and immediately go to the wrong place. And that's because they, they don't know. You don't Mm -hmm. know what you don't know. I mean, they do that about BDSM anyway. I mean, (laughs) you know, everybody else has talked that to death, you know, the, the 50 shades and all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, if you really want to do something, it's what I tell people. If you really want to understand it before you just say, oh, this is bad. This is terrible. This is a, you know, wrong kind of thing. You know, another thing that people don't understand is there doesn't need to be a huge age difference for daddy to and little girl or mommy and little boy or whatever. They can be within three or four years of each other. It's, it's a age. role. I could have been older than him. Yeah, she could have been <laughs> older than me and I can still function as a daddy. It, it is a, it is a mindset. It is a, a way of dealing with your interaction that makes you a daddy, not your age. I mean, I obviously it. you can look at us. We have a pretty large age gap, um, but that is completely separate mm-hmm. than anything else that's going on in our relationship. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thank you both. Like, I know we could always like dig in and dig in and dig in, but um, to I want to respect your time as well. And just, you know, really appreciate everything you shared today before, before we let you go. Is there anything else that you feel called to get out there? I mean, there's a thousand things running through my mind, but, you know, it would just take us off on another hour long talk. So, you know, maybe we'll have to deal with that some other time. I I will tell, I actually want to have you tell this story. There is, I know you guys like to do bloopers. This isn't really a blooper with us specifically. I mean, it is, but it's more of a funny story that happened because, you know, people, people have misunderstandings about what dominance is and what it is and, and things like that. And the relationship between a dominance sub, but this one is kind of a classic type of thing that happens. And it was really for you. Yeah. Tell them the fire. <laughs> story. <laughs> So, okay. So like he said that he always calls me like princess or baby girl. Right. So for, at this point, you know, we've been dating what, like a couple of years or something. So everyone, all his friends, all of our friends, they, that's how they're used to hearing him talk to me. Never calls me by my name. And we were at a, a birthday for his ex-wife and it was like an outdoor venue, a place that had an outdoor like fire pit, you know, with like a gas fire pit with the glass rocks. And we had a friend and she went to like touch, like grab some of the glass rocks out of the fire pit. And he told her, like, hey, don't do that. Like, it's, you know, you're going to burn yourself, right? That's how I am. I just do that with everybody. You know? <laughs> and we're like, okay, right? And then, I don't know, like, then I was kind of, like, being a little bratty, right? So I was like, so then I started to go touch the fire, the rocks in the fire pit. <laughs> and, and he was like, what are you doing? And then I was, he's like, don't do that. And then his wife, like, I went around to the other side of her, and she she knew, like, she knew that, like, you're going to get in trouble, but I'm not going to get in trouble. Right. (laughs) And she was like kind of instigating the situation. She's like, so she grabs some rocks too. Right. And like, I think think she gave them to me. Right. Didn't she grab some rocks and give them to me? Yeah. So then I started grabbing some more rocks, but like, he looked at me 
like, don't do that. You know, like you look at your cat, like, you know, your cat's going to knock something off the counter. And like, (laughs) I was just looking at him and I was like, I'm going to do it anyways. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I went to grab him and then he called me by my name, my real name, so loud that everybody just stopped. It was dead silent. And looked at us. This is a full (laughs) bar. And I called her her name. And nobody had ever heard me say that to her. And she and I used the dad voice, too. So she was just like, oh, no. You know, like when you yell at your children and you call them by <laughs> a full name or something? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was pretty funny. Her eyes got about this big, and so did everybody else's. And they all knew. They're like, like oh. oh. <laughs> you could I'm hear cool. the collective gasp. <laughs> she didn't. It, and I, then I made yeah, her dude, wait. She didn't get her like, punishment for some time. Like weeks. I think I saw him multiple times and he was like, nope, you're not going to know when, <laughs> which is worse. I think, you know, <laughs> Part of the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> no yeah. I was, I'm imagining it like too, like people instigating, like, well, let's egg her on. Let's see how this goes. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. No way. I was going to get trouble. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Well, as Emma has said, thank you both um, for being here and for sharing your story and for using stdcheck.com. What, one final plug for that. Still use but, it. Still right, great. Yeah. We, 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 we. <laughs> I recommend I it. it all the time to friends all the time. So. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Well, with that, we can let you two get along with your day. And yeah, we'll we'll definitely do it again. We'll get a... We I know there's like... T- tons that we could dig into here and I look forward to it so yes. thank you both well thank you thanks guys thanks for having us and we're back thank you thank you Princess and Didi for sharing everything that you did it was a wonderful conversation and we're just excited to get your story out there yeah thank you as Emma said for coming on and I was just gonna one more plug for STD check since that's really that was our reasoning for reaching out I mean not our only reason but that was that was the thing that spurred us was that was the connection point yeah they tagged us in an Instagram post showing that they were getting blood drawn for their STI panel and that they used STD check and we're like hey hey we, we can't just let that fly. So <laughs> they got swag in the mail, and then they got to come on the show and share their amazing stories. So, yeah, using STD Check is has multiple benefits. You can find the links on our website under the Resources tab. <laughs> yep. So with that, we just wanted to remind everybody there is a upcoming virtual meet and greet on January 26th. That is open to anybody and everybody. And for the closed virtual community, our community members, we have an in-person retreat going on just here in a few days, and we're super excited about that. But don't worry, if you want to be part of the next one, go ahead and sign up, and we'll see you at the next one probably later this fall. And you can join virtually in the meantime. You can join virtually and meet all. I think what's so cool about it is people get to know each other, support each other, become friends for months and months, or sometimes years. Some of these people haven't met each other for years in person, and now they get to come together and take that virtual friendship and make it just even deeper yes so i'm just bragging about community <laughs> it's lovely it's amazing i'm proud of what we built yeah, and me I, too. I think it's that's fun why we to talk about, about it yeah that's why we talk about it all the time yeah. so thanks for letting us brag to you <laughs> person who's still here listening because you're amazing and are going to go join us Uh, Next week, we have an interview with Roy. He was back on our podcast in episode 182. So you can go back and listen if you want to. We highly encourage you. And next week, he comes back and gives us an update and shares a lot more information. It's a wonderful story interview, and we can't wait to share it with all of you. Yeah, it was a beautiful conversation. Last episode, he came on with his partner, and this time he's rolling solo, still partnered, but wanted to share a little bit more of his story. And so we're super thrilled about that, and we cannot wait. We will see you all next week. We'll see some of you in just a few days in Atlanta. Bring your raincoats. It's going to rain. Also, bring your weighted shoes because it's going to be windy. (laughs) And we'll see you all there. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.